Habits and Health, episode 44. Welcome to the Habits and Health podcast, where we believe creating healthy habits should be easy. Brought to you by an educator and coach for anyone who wants to create a healthier life. Here's your host, Tony Winyard. Welcome to another edition of the podcast where we give you ideas on ways you can go about improving your health. My guest today is Dr. Anna Smith. She's an NHS GP for over 30 years and she's also a medical acupuncturist. She's also a certified lifestyle physician and a certified tiny habits health coach. And she combines all of that to give her clients quite or patients quite a different uh, set of different ways that she's able to help them. So we find out a lot more about that in this episode as we speak with Dr. Anna Smith. Habits and Health, my guest today, Dr. Anna Smith. How are you, Anna? Very well, thank you. And you're not so... A lot of the guests I interview are on the other side of the world. They're in America or Australia or wherever, but you're only a few miles down the road, really, for me. You're You're in Oxfordshire. I am, absolutely, yes. And is that, is that where you originate from? No, I was born in Surrey in South Croydon, um, in Surrey, which is where I grew up. And okay. then um, basically I moved here. We really moved here for jobs, for my husband's job, Stephen. He got a local job as a GP. And then I, you know, came obviously uh, too. So that's how we ended up here. And speaking of being a GP, I mean, you've got quite a background in, in medicine or in, in the medical world, haven't you? Yes, yes, I have. I've been a GP now for over 30 years. So yes, I have quite a bit of experience and heard an awful lot of things over the years. And and it's not just being a GP. I mean, when I looked at your website, the the amount of study and amount of qualifications you have is quite extensive. Oh, yeah. Would would you like to tell us some, some of the things that you've done? Well, I suppose... If I was going to start by telling you about that, I suppose I should tell you the story of how I got there maybe might be yeah. quite interesting. Okay. Um, so I would say, um, you know, as a child, my home life was slightly stressful. Um, sadly, there was sort of alcohol involved. And my sister sadly um, developed an eating disorder in her teenage years um, and had anorexia nervosa. And sadly, she died when she was 22. And at that stage, I was in my sort of first year at university. I was 19. You know, it was a really difficult time. And that summer, um, I went on holiday with a friend and her family. And I started feeling quite sad and tearful. And I didn't really know what was wrong with me. And in those days, no one really talked around mental health. It just wasn't. It was the 1980s. It just wasn't something people really talked about. Mm. So I kind of muddled through myself, um, continued medical school, got married, had a family, became a GP. But it was over these years, and I think it was because of that experience I'd had, that I started to kind of look at things and say, what made me feel good and what made me feel bad? Mm. And so in my own little day-to-day life experience, I'd be thinking, do you know what? If I go for a walk or I go hell walking or I meet a friend for coffee or I have a good novel on the go, that makes me feel really good. Whereas if I kind of eat junk food, don't sleep so well, don't do any exercise, I don't feel so good. So I think that was the sort of start of me thinking not just about being a GP, but also how our lifestyles affect our health. Um, And so a few years ago, I trained also as a medical acupuncturist with the British British Medical Association of Acupuncture. Um, And then I had a little bit more time with patients. And because I had time with patients, I started to think about how their lifestyles affected their health. And someone once said to me one day, oh, you know, you really should read this amazing book called The Four Pillar Plan by Dr. Rongan Chatterjee. So I read it and it was like, wow, it was like a light bulb moment for me. It was like, oh, my goodness, there's another GP who's actually thinking about lifestyle and there's evidence to support it. And so it sent me on my journey, really. And then I went on to get my diploma in lifestyle medicine, Mm -hmm. the British Society of Lifestyle Medicine. And then I realized I had a reasonable amount of knowledge, but I didn't know how to enable people to change So I went on and did various health coaching courses, including the Tiny Habits health coaching course with BJ Fogg. Hmm. That's kind of my journey through my qualifications and 
uh, into my lifestyle medicine and health coaching. And that's, it sounds like you were really young to have that amount of awareness about the things that you liked and didn't like and how they were affecting you. Because if I get if I understood you right, you were in your 20s when that happened. It, I would say there's not many people in their 20s have that level of awareness. No, and I think that probably goes back to my experience of, um, you know, I'm sure those summer holidays after my sister died, I had quite severe depression and because and no one really talked about it or told me what was wrong with my me. So I kind of muddled through. And I think it was from that I started to notice, gosh, that makes me feel better. That makes me feel worse. So I suppose in some ways you're right. I was reasonably young, but then I carried it on through my life, partly because then other things you know, became more prominent, you know, a GP is quite a stressful, intense job. So I was aware of stress in my life and always trying to manage my stress. So there's various things throughout my life, which made me think about that. Mm. And you mentioned about when you read Dr. Ch- Chatterjee's book and how that surprised you, I guess, in some ways, you know, the, the approach that he takes and, and some of the things he talks about in that book. And it seems to be I mean, I'm I'm not a GP, but from what I understand of many GPs in the UK, there isn't that um, level of open mindedness is not the right word, but being open to sort of many different areas around health, like especially with nutrition and stress and and some of the other areas that he he talks about in that book. I think that's really true. Um, what I think you have to understand is when you go to medical school, people, although on all the guidelines that we call them the NICE guidelines, the National Guidelines for Chronic Disease, one of the first treatments is advice about lifestyle. And yet, when we're at medical school, we're not taught how food affects us, how exercise affects us, how sleep does, how stress does. We'd, we're just not taught any of that. And so... I think really we're taught to treat disease, Mm. which I think we're very good at. Mm. Um, What I like about lifestyle medicine and how our lifestyles affect our health is it works alongside traditional medicine. Mm. Um, And and actually what you just said there about at medical school when you're, you're learning, you know, you're, I mean, what's it, seven years of studying and there's so many things that you're taking in. And the other thing that I understand about for many people I've spoken to who, who have done that is in those seven years, you'll work so hard and expected many people are doing crazy hours of studying and to, to a point where it's almost ignoring the advice that we should be giving to patients about getting good sleep, not getting too stressed. In those studies, many, many of the students aren't getting good sleep. They are very stressed. And that's the way they're starting their, their medical career, as if, as if that's normal. I think that's very true. I mean, there's a lot of fun that goes on at medical school too. But I think what's interesting as you go into your medical career and some of the hospital jobs, um, they are very long hours. Yeah. Um, And that's that's the point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And as a GP, you take on a huge amount of responsibility for people as as any doctor does. Um, So I think there's quite a lot of stress in the career. And you're right. We've never been taught it. Mm. So what was it that made you look to acupuncture? I was at the stage where obviously I'd been a GP for quite a number of years and I was interested in using my medical knowledge in another way to try and develop my career so that I could uh, have maybe a slightly less pressured area of my working life. Hmm. And so um, a friend of mine had trained with acup- in acupuncture and I, rather, I was rather interested in it as an alternative again to perhaps pain relief and all the issues around that. So it's a slightly alternative um, way of dealing with um, some medical conditions. It would seem that there's a real, in, in Britain and maybe in many other Western countries, there's a real misunderstanding of, of acupuncture. It's still, some people think of it as kind of woo-woo, and and there's some people think there's no validity, scientific validity behind it. I mean, I think that's a shame. Um, 
I trained as a medical acupuncturist. And what that basically is, is looking at evidence-based treatment, evidence-based acupuncture treatment involving fine needles. Now, it's all adapted from Chinese acupuncture, but we look at sort of modern understanding of how the body works. We use a medical um, diagnosis uh, as we would in traditional medicine, and then we decide whether acupuncture will work for that condition. Is there enough evidence to treat acupuncture in that condition? Um, I think it'll be interesting. There's quite a problem nowadays um, with treating pain in traditional ways, and there is a crisis now with a lot of people using stronger painkillers. And I think the good thing about acupuncture is it often provides good pain relief. Um, It reduces prescription medication. You've got no side effects, as you would have in medication, and other things such as it might reduce referrals to secondary care. Um, You have a much longer time. I I have a much longer time with patients, so much sort of hands-on approach. Um, And I can look a little bit more around the holistic side of the problem that the patients come to me with so I can look a little around the lifestyle side as well does it does it surprise any of your patients the, the you know what the the benefits they get from it um I think the people who do come and see me are quite open to having acupuncture right. some of them have had it before or sometimes they're looking for an alternative um I think they feel quite confident because I'm a GP as well Um, and I have an interest in lifestyle medicine, so I think there's a sort of confidence around coming to see me. Um, But I I think they're delighted when it works. (laughs) That's what I do think. Are there any specific treatments it's really beneficial for? Yeah, it's beneficial for quite a lot of things. I mean, pain is the sort of typical um, thing we think about using acupuncture for, so musculoskeletal pain, neck pain, back pain, shoulder pain, etc. And then it can be very good for some of those very difficult things to treat, like tennis elbow, golfer's elbow, um, and then some other sort of disorders such as irritable bowel syndrome, um, overactive bladder, migraine headaches, menopausal hot flushes. So quite a variety of conditions, um, as well as... Um, some people and and uh, get sort of tight bands of muscle you know a lot of people get it around their necks and shoulder you know from computer work and mm. studying and whatever and um acupuncture is very good at releasing those what we call myofascial trigger points in muscles um and taking that pain and tension away and is it something that can be just treated once or does it have to be done over a series of weeks months or I would say the average number of treatments for a condition is about six. It may be slightly less than that. It may be slightly more than that. Um, You often don't get an immediate benefit. So sometimes you have to have sort of three, four treatments before you start noticing the benefit with acupuncture. Hmm. And then it, you have that benefit and then you once you get to that stage you can decide whether the treatment is you know how long the treatment is and do many people fear the needles i have a couple of patients who are a little bit nervous about the needles um i think that the um that they are very very fine needles Hmm. so i think people are very surprised when i put in the first needle they often haven't even felt it go in yeah Um, I do try and make the whole experience quite relaxing so that people aren't nervous and anxious about it. But I've not had any major, I've had no one faint or anything like that on me. Partly you lie someone down when you do acupuncture, so it doesn't tend to happen. (laughs) What would be, um, maybe someone's listening and they've got a condition that they would never have considered acupuncture for. And So maybe what I'm getting at is, is there something that some people would be quite surprised that acupuncture would actually help them with, that they probably wouldn't even consider acupuncture in their minds? I think um, more along the lines of irritable bowel syndrome, um, maybe headaches, though it is in the National Guidelines for Headaches. Um, So I think more the overactive bladder, irritable bowel syndrome, maybe menopausal hot flushes are probably the things you don't naturally associate acupuncture with. Okay. And, and when you, so is it when you're seeing a patient or your, your normal patients, 
is it are you only doing acupuncture now or are you still doing your normal sort of gp practice as well I keep them separate. So I do work um, a couple of days a week as an NHS GP. And then I have my private acupuncture clinic and health coaching clinic slightly separately. Okay. And and you, you talked about how Dr. Chatterjee's book was so, you know, you, you enjoyed it so much. So I'm guess and your whole lifestyle approach. So you do you have a maybe a different approach in your GP practice than many other GPs would say? I hope so. I mean, mm-hmm. I think that um, it's really important when someone comes to see you with a chronic disease, and that could be diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, it can be mental illness, um, that rather than just treat the disease with medication, which may be very w- appropriate, mm. we also ensure the patient has some knowledge that lifestyle affects these conditions. And I'll often say to a patient, um, has anyone ever spoken to you about how your lifestyle might affect your blood pressure or your lifestyle might affect your depression? Um, And if they say yes, I'll then explore a little bit, what do you know about it? If they say no, I might ask them, you know, how would you feel if we we, um, had a little chat about how your lifestyle might affect your health in the long term? So it depends where the patient is and how... Uh, I might approach it, um, and it's whether the patient is happy for me to talk about those things and introduce that concept. What I'm usually nicely surprised about is that people generally are very receptive to talking about lifestyle and how their lifestyle affects their disease. We hear in the media all the time that GPs are so under so much pressure they're only able to have 10 15 minutes with each patient is is that something that's that is true in your practice or is it different for you i think it's true everywhere uh i think we are under huge time constraints yes we are and and so that's in a way i'm quite lucky with my health clinic because i do have longer time um but i equally think it's really important for my nhs patients that they have at least some understanding and because my time's more um, you know, restricted with with my NHS patients, I might often say to them, you know, would you ever read a book? If I if I suggested a book, is that the kind of thing you do? So that they can go off and perhaps do some of the reading themselves um, and gain knowledge that way. So, so it sounds like it's quite tricky for you to to be able to do the job that you know you can do for these patients because there's so such, such limited time. Yes, we are very limited in time. There is no question about that. Yes. And is that, yeah. is that frustrating? Yes, it has its limitations and it can be very frustrating. Yes, it can. Yes. Yeah. We hope you're enjoying this episode of the Habits and Health podcast, where we believe that creating healthy habits should be easy. If you know a friend or a loved one who might be interested in learning simple habits to improve their health, then please share this podcast with them. We also invite you to subscribe and to leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. Now, back to the show. So you mentioned about that you did the the, habit, the training in tiny habits. So how, how do you implement that in what you do? Tiny Habits is a course run by BJ Fogg, a behavioralist in America. And his really key message is people will change behavior if they feel good. Mm. And one of these slight problems we have is we often consider that motivation is what gets us up and going to change behavior. And the problem is motivation is a wave. It's quite an unreliable thing. Mm. So if I give you, maybe I'll just talk through an example, perhaps. That'd be perfect. Um, yeah. So for instance, um, I had this 30 year old lady came to see me and she wanted to lose weight. So, We kind of looked at all aspects of her life, Um, her diet, which actually was very good, her exercise regime, I couldn't really fault. She was doing sort of aerobic exercise three or four times a week. She was doing boot camps at weekends. Um, Her sleep wasn't great. She was waking up a few times at night. And what I noticed was her stress around work and some of her home life was very high. So she had very high stress levels. Um, Now, her aspiration was to lose weight. 
And so what we ended up doing is we looked at that aspiration and we then were, looked at all the different behaviors that might help her manage her stress. Now, I know that people might be a bit confused why you're managing her stress when she's coming to weight loss, but um, there is quite a lot of evidence to say with stress increasing your cortisol levels, which causes something called insulin resistance. It affects your hunger and your satiety hormones and therefore weight gain. And also poor sleep does a very similar uh, sort of thing where you get, uh, if you had poor sleep, you tend to have, uh, you want more high calorie sugary foods, mm -hmm. you get poor impulse control, um, it feeds into insulin resistance and you put on weight. Mm -hmm. So I thought stress was quite a key factor to look at mm -hmm. um, for this lady. So we looked at all the behaviors that might make her re reduce her stress levels. Mm -hmm. We looked at kind of breathing exercises, We looked at maybe could she stretch at intervals in the day? Could she perhaps change one of her aerobic classes to a yoga class? Um, was there any time in the day when she had a, could have a quiet cup of tea? Anything that would reduce her stress. And we literally just went through lots and lots and lots of different behaviors. And then with each one of those ideas, we looked at how impactful would that behavior be and how easy would it be to do? Hmm. And what we did was we chose behaviors that had high impact for her aspiration that would lower her stress mm -hmm. and would be very easy to do. And then what we did is we made it tiny. Right. Because if you don't make it small and you don't make it easy to do, you won't do it. Hmm. Now, she chose a couple of things. So she chose uh, breathing, I think it was. She did choose to replace one of her aerobic classes with the yoga class in the week. Mm. And she did choose a quiet cup of tea when she came home in the evening. Right. And what we did was we said she needed a, you need a prompt to remind you. Mm -hmm. Then you do the behavior. And then the idea is you feed back and feel good about yourself or celebrate. Yeah. So the prompt for her with the breathing was that she did quite a lot of driving and her job was getting in the car. Okay. So on getting in the car, starting the engine, she would then remember, that's when I'm going to do some calm breathing. Right. That was one idea. And the other was the quiet cup of tea when she got home. So that involved sort of coming in the front door. She'd let the dogs out in the garden and then she'd go and make the cup of tea, sit in the sitting room in a particular space and have a quiet cup of tea and just sit with her feelings about the day. And it was that... What we worked with her through was reducing her stress so that then that improved her metabolism, her insulin resistance, as we call it, and that she started to lose weight because it had been the stress that had probably stopped her losing weight in the first place. Uh, did that surprise her? Yes. Yeah. Because as most people with uh, wanting to lose weight, there's this message we're sold about calories in equal calories out. And it's a lot more complicated than that. It relies, it's, it's, it's on, there are lots of different areas and issues around weight that we don't, you know, we don't, no one is really told or informed about. Hmm. And you mentioned about the celebration aspect. As, as Brits, we're not always great at celebrating. So did, did she find that easy or was that, how, how was that for her? I think it's the hardest thing to do because that's exactly, you know, BJ Fogg says you have your prompt, so your mind, you have your behavior, which is tiny, and then you do the celebration, which is a very American thing to do. And you're absolutely right. I think it's a hard sell for the British, mm. the British public. Um, I think you can do it in sort of ways that work for you. Mm. Um, and, you know, it can just be a moment of just, you know, um, just feeling that pleased with yourself, acknowledging in your own mind that you've done it. It can be a simple smile. Um, it can be a kind of, you know, thumbs up. So it can be quite a small thing, but I think it is a harder thing to do. However, I do think it's really important we make ourselves feel good. Hmm. And if you feel good about something, you will carry on doing the activity. Okay. Anyone listening who's maybe not familiar with the Tiny Habits book and they may be wondering, well, why is the celebration part so important? What would you say to them? 
We are, because um, we only change by feeling good, hmm. basically. Um, we don't generally change by people making us feel bad yeah. about things. And that's why it's so important to wire that good feeling into us. So do the behavior, celebrate in some way so that you wire that behavior back in. Mm. And so has that person you, you were speaking about, has she managed to maintain her weight now since, since that? Yeah, so she's managed her stress much more. She's lost some weight and she's much happier. Right. So is this, I mean, how, when, when did you do the course with BJ? I did the course with BJ earlier this year. Okay. And so how easy or difficult has it been to implement that into what you do? I think it's fairly easy. I think that um, because people often rely, people often think like rely on motivation, like I said earlier, Hmm. and also they think they have to make a big change. And I think the key is don't rely on your motivation, rely on a prompt to remind you a tiny habit to very small so you'll do it Mm. and then feedback feel good factor back into your feelings and self-esteem and you'll carry on doing it you talked also before about in order the different training that you've did you've done you did some health coach training as well yes And, and what was it that made you decide to do that so it was really similar along the lines of BJ Fogg, it was about the fact that I felt I had knowledge in lifestyle aspects, you know, things like stress or sleep or how we should eat or move, Hmm. but I didn't have the ability to enable people to change. So that's why I did health coaching with with Tiny Habits being one of those courses. Is it? I wonder if it was, if more GPs, well, I want, do many GPs have, do extra training like you have, w- taking things like tiny habits and health coaching and so on? Or are they, are there more GPs who are just so busy they just don't have time to be doing those sort of things? Um, I think um, general practice is a very intense career. I think a lot of GPs are incredibly busy. What some GPs are starting to do is have what we call portfolio careers. So you're a part-time GP and you part-time do something else. Um, It's hard to say how many of them would be doing things like health coaching or lifestyle. Um, But certainly they're not as many GPs who are just doing GP. They're often doing something else as well. Right. So you think it what is it? In, in the last 10, 20 years, has it changed quite a bit then? It's changed hugely. Yeah. Right. I would say in the last sort of 20 years, it has changed hugely. Yes, right. people much people are more likely to have a portfolio type career where they do different jobs right. in and, a week. And are there more GPs now with a, a maybe open to say nutrition and so on? And, and the reason I, I ask that is because I had an experience once where I, I saw my GP, and this was probably about 15 years ago, and I my iron count was quite low at the time, and I was kind of doing some experimenting with not eating meat and dairy at the time. And and I was very aware that the reason my iron count was low was because of the eating I was doing, you know, the way I was eating at that time. And, and I remember her saying to me, oh, this has nothing to do with what you're eating. And I said, well, it's got everything to do with what I'm eating. And so I, I was really... I was just so surprised that her reaction, that, well, this has got nothing to do with nutrition, was basically what she told me. Yeah. I think I think it goes back to, you know, um, when we're at medical school, we're not taught about lifestyle, about what food we should eat or how we should sleep or how we should move. And so I think a lot of GPs aren't really very aware of those aspects. Um, and yet, as I said, in the chronic disease guidelines the number one um treatment is lifestyle advice yeah i also think it's it is also hard for the public because also there's lots of information out there but it's very confusing and overwhelming as well right and and since you've done the the training in the behavior science and health coaching and so on are you? Do you feel you're able to get get much better results for your patients? I hope so. <laughs> I do hope so. 
Um, I think, I hope I open up to them the opportunity that they have a chance to change their life or change their health. And that can be mental and physical health. And for people listening who maybe aren't really sure, what, what is a health coach? How, what, what would you say? How would you describe that? A health coach is someone who helps, who helps someone manage their health, coaches them to better health. Hmm. Um, because like we said before, people don't know how to change or they are um, too busy um, with their lives, they're time constrained, they're overloaded with information, they're confused. Um, and so the idea of a health coach is they may come they may come to me saying, oh, look, I've got high blood pressure, I'd like to sleep better, but they don't know how to do it. Right. And so the idea is I would help them work through that with them. As opposed to a GP who would maybe just diagnose something instead. Yes. I mean, as GPs, what we're excellent at doing, I think, is making a diagnosis and treating people. Hmm. Um, I think we're very, very good at that. Um, what's nice about lifestyle medicine is it works alongside traditional medicine. Right. In, on the subject of behaviour change and, and habits and so on, what what habits have you found most helpful in your own life implementing? Probably the most helpful habit, I think, is I, I injured my knee a few years ago. And I don't know whether you, you know, I was I went to see a physio and I was given exercises to do. And, you know, life takes over. And I was thinking, when am I ever going to do these exercises? I don't have time. But I was also interested in the time with mindfulness and maybe a little bit of meditation and things. So I started to think, right, I have got to fit these exercises in somewhere. So what I my best uh, uh, habit is really I get up in the morning, shower, get dressed, come downstairs, let the dogs out. That's my my prompt. Go straight into the sitting room and I basically do 10 minutes of exercises. Partly it started for my knee, um, but it's ended up being sort of mindful movement and a little bit of resistance uh, exercise that we should all do. And I just do 10 minutes every morning and it sets me up for the day mentally. It makes me feel like I don't react to things in the day. I tend to respond to things. I think my stress levels are lower and I feel generally better in myself. And I wish I'd started doing it years ago. But so when did you start doing this? Only about uh, three or four years ago. Um, can you, is it noticeable, the difference? For me, yes. And what about I for people? My stress levels are less. I notice, like I said, I tend to respond rather to react to things. And but is it noticeable to people around you as well? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> and because, I mean, you mentioned about how stressful it is working as a GP. So doing something like that is, it sounds like so important. Yes, I think these things are important um, for GPs, but I think for so many people. Mm. You know, one of the main things I see in general practice is stress-related illness. Right. We see a lot of depression, anxiety. We see a lot of people who have high blood pressure and getting overweight because of stress. Um, so I would say um, stress and managing stress is one of the key things for a lot of people managing their work and their home. And is so so. St you mentioned that stress is probably my, one of the most prevalent things you're seeing with people. And what about um, sleep? I think that stress often feeds into poor sleep, right. um, and I think a lot of people are quite troubled with sleep. Right. Yes, I would say it's quite a prominent. Again, it comes in if you have mental illness, often your sleep isn't very good. And if you have physical illness, often your sleep isn't very good. And certainly if you have stress, um, it often disrupts your sleep pattern. And how has the whole situation we've had in the last two years with the sort of lockdowns and pandemic and so on, how, how uh, it, would you say there's more stress since, since this has happened with, with your patients you're seeing? I think there has been an explosion of mental health issues. Um, whether that's through the loneliness and the lockdown, um, 
people now working from home on their own, not having that necessarily face-to-face social support. Mm. Um, I think there's a certain amount of social anxiety from having been in lockdown and now we're out of lockdown. Um, And, you know, generally we're made for connection with people. It's good for our physical health. It's good for our mental health. Um, We know if we're socially isolated, our stress hormone cortisol goes up and our stress levels go up. Um, So I think it has had a huge effect. You talked before about Dr. Chatterjee's book. Has it given you a taste of maybe writing your own book? Oh, (laughs) if I could write a book that was as good as that, I would. Um, I don't know if I will ever quite write a book. Uh, yes, we will see. We will see. Uh, are there? Is there a book that has that has really moved you that you can remember in your life? A book that's really moved me would be the Salt Path. Okay. That probably is a book that's really moved me. Um, and why? It's a really incredible story. True story. A credible story about homelessness. And how long ago was it you read that? I read that about two or three years ago. Okay. If people want to find out more about you, Anna, where will will be the best places to look? Um, Probably on my website, um, www.gpacupuncturoxford.co.uk. You can find me on Facebook, GP Acupuncture and Lifestyle, and on Instagram. Um, I'm not that active on social media. Um, but I do occasionally post things there. And are you, I'm guessing, are you own, do you only see people face to face or do you do online appointments as well? Um, obviously for the acupuncture, I do face to face, but I do do online, uh, zoom appointments for health coaching. Yes. Right. Okay. And just before we finish, is there, is there a quotation that you like? Yes. Um, I don't know who wrote this or whether it was something I um, read, but I like one that goes, a healthy lifestyle not only changes your body, it changes your mind, your attitude and your mood. And what, what is it about that that appeals to you? Because it's about the fact that our lifestyles affect our mental and our physical health. Well, Anna, thank you for your time. It's been a real pleasure. I haven't, it's the first time we've spoken about acupuncture on this uh, on the podcast, and I've been wanting to for quite a while. So, so thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Next week, episode forty-five is with Renee Jones. She spent forty years on a diet yo-yo before over- overcoming emotional stress, and has been eating to reach and maintain her goals since two thousand and twelve. She has a master's degree in counselling, a clinical residency and training in contemporary models of care. And her book, What's Really Eating You, Overcome the Triggers of Comfort Eating, is an Amazon bestseller. So that's next week with Renee Jones. If you did get some real value from this week's episode with Dr. Anna Smith, please do share the episode with anyone who you think could get some real value from it. And I hope you have a great week. Thanks for tuning in to the Habits and Health Podcast, where we believe creating healthy habits should be easy. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. Sign up for email updates and learn about coaching and workshop opportunities at TonyWinyard.com. See you next time on the Habits and Health Podcast.